from LPM, Louisville Public Media. Support comes from Vision Zero. On foot or behind the wheel, safety is a shared responsibility. And Vision Zero Louisville believes zero roadway fatalities is the only acceptable amount. Their mission is to create safe roads by design, engineering solutions, and education. More information at visionzerolouisville.org. I'm a Jew from Kentucky, that's what I am. The good Lord foresaw it with his infinite plan. Welcome to the Bluegrass Schmooze. I'm Rabbi Shani Abramowitz. I'm Rabbi Ben Freed. And this month, we are going to be talking with Dr. Karen Berg. This episode uh, is dropping just before Election Day. Um, So we are going to be talking a little bit about Jews in politics and what civic engagement looks like in the Jewish community. Spoiler alert, there isn't one way that Jews are civically engaged um, or that Jews think about any given political issue. Um, But Ben and I are going to talk a little bit about what our politics mean to us and how we see the role of uh, Jewish identity playing out in politics. I think that's right. I think that there is no one way that Jews vote or one way that Jews think about things. But one thing, not only in America today, but really throughout history, is that Jews have been very highly civically engaged. Mm-hmm. And if, you, if you're listening to this, if you haven't made a plan to vote, if you haven't already voted early, no matter where you are, the one thing that I think that you know any rabbi anywhere in the world can agree on is that you should vote. That we're not going to tell you how to vote. We're not going to tell you who to vote for specifically. But civic engagement being a part of the of the civic process is something that is really important because in part is that our, our politics and voting is a way that we live out our values. Right. That we have we have values. We talk all every week from the Bema and our sermons and we, you know, write articles and we do all these things about Jewish values. And one of the way that we live our values out in the world is through civic engagement. Yeah. Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, who is a 20th century Orthodox legal scholar, um, actually says that Jews are obligated to vote in American Jews are obligated to vote in our elections here um, because it's our way of not only paying it forward, but expressing gratitude, saying thank you to the American government for actually in in a lot of different ways. um, But especially when, you know, communities, Jewish communities were fleeing Eastern Europe and seeking refuge and safety in the United States, um, when we vote, that is our way of saying thank you to the American government for actually rescuing us um, and saving us. And so we vote, uh, we're commanded, according to Moshe Feinstein, Rabbi Feinstein, um, to vote to express our our thanks to the government, to, to the country that took us in. Yeah. And I think not only for rescuing us, but for for being a place where we can vote that it has not always been taken for granted by Jews, no matter where we've been living since kind of Jews haven't had from when the temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70 CE until the modern state of Israel in 1948, Jews didn't have their own country. And so the only way that they could possibly influence things was through civic engagement. And America is one of the few places throughout history where Jews have had equal opportunity to do that. And that's really something to be celebrated. And that's amazing. And, you know, with all the flaws in, inherent in any political system, uh, the fact that we that we live in a country that that guarantees us that right, that I think that that's also part of that, why we are commanded to take advantage of it. Right. Right. And the, the obligation that he sort of enjoins upon modern contemporary Jews um, does not mean that all Jews vote as a bloc. Right. We are obligated to vote. We are obligated to participate in uh, civic society and civil society in the United States. Um, But that is not the same as saying that we all vote together. We are all monolithic in our political thinking. Um, And I know that that assumption or perception is not unique necessarily to the Jewish community. I think Mm -hmm. it's very easy to lump any ethnic group or religious group together and say they must all think about X, Y, or Z issue um, the same way. And uh, I'm here to tell you that that's not at (laughs) all the case. Um, And not only within, you know, the wide American Jewish community, but um, even within 
congregations and smaller, more local Jewish community, Mm -hmm. there is lots of political difference and disagreement and diversity. Yeah. And like you were saying, that's true of any, you know, group of people who people assume all vote the same Mm -hmm. way, whether that's, you know, a a racial group or an ethnic group (laughs) or a gender or any of that, that people do vote differently. They have different opinions about things. They are not single. Some people are single issue voters, but many people are not. And even people who are single issue voters think differently about whatever that single issue is. Right. And so I do think that, right, you know, we say that, um, you know, some people de- define areas of the country as, as as blue or red or that. And most of our synagogues are some shade of purple. Mm-hmm. Some might be bluer shades of purple. Some might be redder shades of purple that, you know, we, we are aware that those exist. And when we do look on a large scale demographically, we can say it is true that, you know, a certain percentage of Jews will tend to vote for, for this or the other. And it's true that historically um, a, a majority really since the New Deal, since the the, the World War II and the Roosevelt era – um, Jews have historically tended to vote more Democratic than Republican, um, usually by somewhere around a – between a 70 to 30 to an 80-20 breakdown, um, though that varies by by denomination. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah. that does not mean that, you know, statistics are statistics for a reason. That means that – that doesn't mean that w- when you walk up to any given Jew that you can assume that you know their political opinions or which way they will vote. But what you can assume probably, and this is also held out, is that they will vote. Like Mm -hmm. Shani was saying, is that we are a very highly civically engaged people. um, And that leads to to high levels of civic participation and and voter participation, even if people might feel differently about specific issues. Yeah, it's – I'm really curious, Ben, to hear your experience of this. But one place where this tends to break down or at least get – muddied, um, muddled is, you know, we belong to the conservative movement (laughs) of Judaism. And to be honest, in when I lived in Chicago or Boston or New York, everyone knew what that meant, right? Even people who weren't themselves part of the conservative movement understood that that meant, well, you're religiously, you're, you're someplace between orthodoxy and reform. You're sort of squarely in the middle. You're uh, sort of traditionally observant, but also flirting with modernity and progressivism. Um, and culturally, it was familiar and people understood what it what it means when you say, I'm a conservative Jew. Since I moved to Kentucky, um, <laughs> of course, other conservative Jews understand what that affiliation means. Um But people from outside the Jewish community who come to our community are curious about Judaism, want to learn more about it, are maybe themselves curious about converting eventually, um, think that it it has to do with a political affiliation. And it's become part of my spiel when I'm meeting someone new, um, and especially someone who's not Jewish, um, to say, this actually, it's a misnomer. Um, (laughs) I... (laughs) <laughs> you know, this is a conversation maybe to have with our rabbinic association, but it's it's <laughs> probably a, a title or affiliation that's worth re-examining, ex- rethinking about. I think we, uh, anyway, so many people don't understand exactly what it means, and it's become part of my spiel to clarify this is not a political affiliation. Um, rather, it has to do with conserving tradition. Um, and finding a, a happy medium between tradition and change. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm I'm curious if you feel, I, I often feel a little bit defensive about that. You know, yeah. no, no, we're not, you know, <laughs> there are people in our communities who are politically conservative, Absolutely. but as a whole, that is not at least reflected in, in our denominational affiliation. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, and I think that, because I, I agree with you. I wonder if it's less geographic and more like time based mm-hmm. that like I think the word conservative just is much more out there that I think at least when I was growing up in the 90s and early 2000s, people much more used just like Democrat or Republican. Right. Like people didn't identify as much as progressive or conservative. Sure. It was more like party label. But more recently, I think just that that word conservative has really I think maybe it's like Tea Party ish time or like, you know, mm-hmm. other things when like conservative became like a, a buzzword a that people buzzword. were latching on to. Right. And so, yeah, I think that, look, it's a real branding issue at this point for yeah. uh, for the movement, um, which, again, as you said, it was about conserving change or actually 
kind of when reform broke away from orthodox, conservative was kind of a reaction to reform. Mm -hmm. And so it was the more conservative of those two. Right. Um, But it doesn't um, it doesn't necessarily have that same connotation now that, Mm -hmm. you know, we have people who are part of conservative congregations who would identify as politically conservative. And we have people who would identify as politically progressive and people who are centrist and all of that. Uh, And we often try to say, oh, it's it's not small C conservative. It's big (laughs) C conservative. But then that just ends up confusing (laughs) things even more. Um, So really, we just we it it is it is a branding thing. I know that the um, the Israeli branch of our movement and the kind of worldwide branch of the conservative movement is the Masorti movement. So who knows? Maybe we'll kind of bring that Hebrew in and try to be, you know, Masorti in America. But especially with the way that people use conservative and and liberal and progressive so much more now, it definitely does lead to some confusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually opened up, I think, some interesting and important teaching opportunities for me. I've had, you know, quite a few people come. This actually happened a lot when I first moved here. Um, People who were curious people who are not Jewish, who are curious about why our movement supports uh, the ordination of gay and lesbian Mm -hmm. uh, rabbis and cantors and also um, permits its rabbis and cantors to perform same-sex marriage Mm -hmm. um, to to people who read the Bible in a particular way, but also in a more politically conservative way, um, that approach and that practice seem to be incompatible. You know, you call yourself a conservative congregation, and yet you seem to be so liberal <laughs> and open-minded when it comes to these important, um, you know, social social issues. And um, I remember feeling very frustrated and actually confused by those conversations because it is not something that I ever encountered before I moved here. Um, this sort of, uh, I don't want to say stridency, but you say that you're this, why aren't you living up to this Mm. name or this title or this affiliation? And this question was coming from people who didn't know Jews. Right. Um, And so that also felt a little bit um, strange and and difficult to manage at times. But all to say that the the misnomer and our our conservative name, I think the, the bright side or the silver lining is that it's opened up some really interesting learning and conversation across difference. Yeah. And I think in general, there's like an, I guess like I could even call like an ick factor to non-Jews telling Jews how they think they should or shouldn't be voting or, you know, be feeling about things. And I think that it's a really, you know, important thing that like, look, as Jews, there, there are certainly Jews who would tell other Jews how to vote. Um, Rabbis tend to not be among them that we as clergy take pretty seriously that we encourage civic engagement, but we don't tell you, you know, how you should be doing that. But when people outside of the Jewish community tell the Jewish community what they should be doing or how they should feel about a certain issue or which candidate they should they should be voting for, um, there's there there's a weirdness there that like, mm-hmm. oh, you you are people who believe this, so you should vote in this way right. um, from people who are not within our community um, can feel bad. And that that's actually something that in polling, the vast majority of Jews regularly believe is that, you know, people should not be telling us, you know, how to make those decisions. Um, But kind of on those same lines, there's this interesting thing that that has happened in America in part because Jews have prioritized civic engagement so much and Mm -hmm. do, you know, regularly get out and vote is that there is an overrepresentation of Jews in politics, Mm -hmm. um, in in you know, local politics and state politics and in, in federal politics that at one point there was a, a minion of Jews in the Senate, that there were 10 Jews serving in the Senate when we do not make up 10 percent of the population of America. Right. And I think that where where it's tricky is that we want to encourage Jewish participation. We're proud of all those Jews who are doing all those amazing things. And one of the classic Jewish stereotypes that goes back or anti-Semitic stereotypes, I should say, that goes back, you know, hundreds of years is that Jews are trying to control the government, that they're trying to put their fingers in all of these things. And so when we have high civic participation and high civic engagement and Jews serving in these positions of power, it can be a little uncomfortable because it can lead to people making these claims that there is something nefarious about that. Right. 
it's just as problematic as when JFK was running and people were concerned that would he be beholden to the Pope or would he be beholden to, Mm -hmm. you know, the people uh, of America, that those same, you know, accusations of some sort of dual loyalty or that they're working only for the Jews and not for everyone, uh, that it can be really problematic and it can be hurtful to the people in office. It can be hurtful also just to regular Jews to see other Jews who are just being good Americans and, you know, participating in, in this process being questioned because of their Jewish identity. Yeah, I'm really glad you raised that. And and just on the, the flip side, we're also seeing, and this is not necessarily new, but I think more pronounced in our particular political moment, which is the, the weaponization of anti-Semitism by communities of who are not Jewish. Um, and I'm I'm thinking specifically about, you know, when the Democratic nominee for president shifted and and Kamala Harris was uh, tasked with choosing her running mate. And there was a lot of excitement about Josh Shapiro potentially, you know, wow, there's a a Jewish person who's on the, the short list. And then when he didn't get picked for lots of different reasons, there were a lot of outside voices, voices from outside the Jewish community who were saying, well, this means that the Democratic Party hates Jews. Um, and I don't I, I all I, I really that really grates at me and I don't know exactly what to, to do with it. Um, but anti-Semitism, both real anti-Semitism, but also the perception of anti-Semitism or even the sort of creation of inaccurate claims of anti-Semitism um, just gets used and lobbed in lots of different ways um, that can be very harmful, as you say. Yeah. Um, you may be listening to this right before the election. And and again, I think that it's really important to note that the message from from the schmoozers, from the rabbis is just that, that voting is important. That we hold our, our that our values are important. That you one of the ways that we are given you know the right to express those values, right? Or we have the right, I should say, to express those values in America is at the ballot box, um, and, and we think that it's really important that we do so. Um, and there are a lot of different things that that might be on your mind, whether you are Jewish or not, that might impact you know the way that you vote. Uh, but that it's really important to 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 do the research, to think about the candidates, to be you know as civically engaged as possible. Because voting voting is the is the floor, hopefully not the ceiling. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. That 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 voting is great. We everyone should vote, and you can research candidates. You might find a candidate that you really love, and you might you know next cycle you know volunteer for them or work for them. There are all of these different ways to do so. And um, you know it, the the rabbis uh, say when they're talking about. Uh, uh, the Seder on Passover, that the more one tells the story of Passover, hareze mishubach, the more they are praised. And I feel like civic engagement is the same way. Like, you can do the baseline, but the more you do it, hareze mishubach. Right. That, like, the more you get involved, uh, the better, uh, because that's that's how we live out our values in our country. And uh, we hope that... Um, that you will that you will do so that you will be uh, participants in that in that amazing system, um, and Jews, you know, bezrat Hashem, you know, please God will will continue to do so, um, and will continue to do so in ways that help to build America uh, as a country, uh, and that help to uh, to move our country forward. Thanks, Ben. I just also want to say when you do go to vote. Um, please, please, please thank your poll workers. Yes. Um, it is often a thankless job, and they are there for hours. They are often there all day long, um, ensuring that our right to vote is is protected and that we are safe um, doing so. So just smile, say thank you. Um, it goes a long way. Yeah. And maybe next time you'll want to be a poll worker. Who knows? Uh, we'll be back uh, after this break with Dr. Karen Berg, uh, a Jewish resident of Louisville and a member of our state Senate here in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Stick with us. Forever a Jew with Kentucky, my home. Welcome back to the Bluegrass Schmooze. We are so honored to be sitting here with Dr. Karen Berg, State Senator Dr. Karen Berg, uh, who is a physician also serving in the Kentucky State Senate, representing the 26th District, which includes some of downtown and East Louisville. 
Uh, she was first elected to the Kentucky Senate in a special election in 2020 and is the only Jewish member of the Kentucky State Senate. Dr. Berg is a graduate of Central High School here in Louisville, Kentucky, which is important because if you're from Louisville, you know everyone asks where you went to high school. She also went to the University of Kentucky, where she earned her bachelor's, and the University of Louisville, where she earned her doctor of medicine. She's a politician, so we won't ask her whether she's a Cards or a Cats fan because we don't want to put her too much on the spot. Uh, and while in the state Senate, Dr. Berg has supported Governor Andy Bashir's efforts to reinstate Kentucky's health insurance exchange and currently serves as a member of the Kentucky Anti-Semitism Task Force, started by the governor in late 2023. And she's advocated tirelessly for the LGBTQ plus community here in Kentucky. Dr. Berg, Karen, welcome to the schmooze. Well, good afternoon, guys, and thank you very much for inviting me to schmooze with you. <laughs> Yeah, welcome. It's so it's so good to have you, and it's really an honor to have this time. So we um, we start all of our conversations by asking our guests to tell us a little bit about their Jewish background, their Jewish bio, how they grew up, and how Judaism has come to play an important role in your life today. Hmm, all right. Um, I was born and raised here in Louisville, Kentucky, by two um, first-generation Jews. My grandparents, all four of them, had come on boats from Eastern Europe mm -hmm. after the pogroms, but mm -hmm. before World War II. Um, so both my parents were first-generation Americans. My father ended up down here in Kentucky because the University of Louisville School of Medicine had a national reputation for accepting Jewish applicants. Hmm. And in New York, there were significant quotas for Jewish um, applicants. So his family physician had trained at UofL and gone back to New York. So he came down here, actually when he was 16 years old, to go to undergraduates huh. so that he would have a leg up to get into medical school. Wow. So that's how he came down here. He brought my mother down here many, many, many years later. Um, and they raised four children. So I was raised in the Reformed Congregation, the Temple, at Brish, uh, Brisholem. Um, you know, my grandparents were Orthodox. Mm -hmm. My parents pretty much chose to be Reform. All four of us wore bat mitzvah, and my oldest sister, Amy, was the first bat mitzvah hmm. in the state of Kentucky. Wow. It never wow. happened. Oh, yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, all four of us were confirmed, and all four of us attended Jewish summer camp. Mm. And I think that was really um, the, you know, what puts the hammer and the mm -hmm. nail together into solidifying a really strong. Jewish identity. So all four of us at the time attended Union Camp Institute, which is now Goldman Union Camp Institute mm -hmm. in Zionsville. We're um, going to have a whole episode uh, later this year on Jewish summer camp. So yes. we've had a lot of our guests have mentioned it and we've like talked uh -huh. about it a bit here and there. So we're going to do a whole summer camp episode. Right. Well, and I think I, I could be wrong about this, but I think that Gucci, mm -hmm. Goldman Union Camp Institute, has produced more rabbis hmm. in the United States than any other summer camp. Wow. Hmm. My daughter being one of them. Yes. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I mean, we were just absolutely Jewish from day one, in and out. Yeah. But, you know, in an area where that was not necessarily a very common thing mm -hmm. to uh -huh. be. So thank you. So I guess uh, where this the theme of our our episode this month is is Jews and civic engagement or Jews and politics. So I'm just curious, how did you go from being Doctor Berg to State Senator Doctor Berg? <laughs> did you did you just have an epiphany one day? Did someone ask no, you to no, run? No, no, like no, no. how how did that happen? Yeah. No. Um. Actually, this was my original intent. Oh. I was a political science major double minored in psychology and, and sociology, majored in political science. My full intention was to go to law school, mm. and then really I wanted to be a judge. Huh. That was, you know, if you'd asked me from the time I was 
eight, nine years old, what did I want? I wanted to be a judge. Um, somewhere in the course of my college career, I did an internship for legal aid one summer, mm. and these guys were miserable. Mm. I mean, <laughs> at the end of the summer, they sat me down, they had a little going away party for me, and they said, Karen, don't do this. You can do anything you want to do. We have no funds. We have no ability to mm. impact the things we want to impact. Mm. Run. So I've honestly went back. I took all the prerequisites for medical school in one year. Wow. <laughs> Applied to medical school, went to medical school. I have absolutely loved, loved, loved uh, being a physician. Hmm. But as I got to the end of my career, I felt like um, through a series of circumstances, I was motivated to go back to what my original intention was. And that is why I ran for office. Hmm. Yes. Do you feel like your Judaism played a role or the Jewish values that you were raised with played a role in helping you think that, you know, you wanted to be a judge one day and get into politics? Well, absolutely. I mean, because, you know, the, the goal is to kun alam. Mm -hmm. The goal is to repair the world. And, you know, I was always taught it doesn't have to be the littlest act, mm -hmm. the smallest act it matters as much as the greatest revelation, you know. So, you know, to me, this is just part of trying to give back. I mean, I was retiring from medicine. Mm -hmm. I had the time. I had the knowledge, you know. I mean, I, I studied this, and I had the will. So I mm -hmm. just thought, you know what? This is my chance to go back and sort of do what I wanted to do to begin with. So the other politicians who we've talked to, our very first episode, we talked to mayors um, Greenberg and Abramson. Uh, and we asked them if there is one Jewish text or value other than tikkun olam, because tikkun olam gets a lot of play. We, lo we love fixing the world. But is there one text or one value other than tikkun olam that either has guided you or that you've talked about either on a campaign trail or in a – um, or in your in your time in office that has kind of, you know, been there for you? If I am not for myself, who will be for me? If I am only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? Mm -hmm. that, that does have a significant motivation, a motivating sort of, force for me. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a quote from uh, Hillel the Elder. It's found in Pirkei Avot, the ethics of, uh, of our ancestors. So much of politics and just being a, a person who is civically engaged right. is to say, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? That I do have to look out for my own interests. But if I'm only for, for myself, myself, what am, am I? I? That I can't only think of my own interests because if I voted or acted or did all these things only according to my own selfish interests, then, you know, I'm not really thinking about the body politic as a whole, about everyone. And vim loach shavim if not now when. That now is always the best time to, to yeah. do that. Yeah, it's um, – I think there's a lot of power in that message, a lot of power – if I am only for myself, what am I? Who am I? And that is something, guys, you know, I mean, medicine and politics, so different because in medicine, you win when everybody wins, mm -hmm. when everybody goes together and everybody works towards the same exact goal because we all have the same goal. It's to get a patient better. Mm -hmm. Um in politics, it's it's you know it's a real different. Winning can be very hollow, very mm. hollow, if you're not careful what you're putting your energy behind. Mm. So, in addition to this being our Cheshvan episode, it's also going to be coming out in November, which we know is Trans Month of Awareness and. I didn't know your son personally, uh, Henry, because by the time I'd moved here, he was already living out of town. Uh, but I've heard so much about the work that he did as a as a trans rights activist, as just a human being here in town and across America. Can you share with us a little bit about Henry and his life? Hmm. 
Henry just had a book dedicated in his memory. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, a book about trans joy, mm. living living life in joy. Henry was my my second child. He um, was raised, you know, at at Temple. At, mm-hmm. um, when he went off to college to uh, George Washington University, he came back to me and he said, "Mom, you didn't teach me anything about my religion." <laughs> 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 um, no, he really did. He was very, very interested in learning, and he actually studied with both um, uh, with two Orthodox rabbis, both the Chabad rabbi and the Hillel rabbi, um, for several years. Wow! Yeah, um, including I think he went up to Maryland University of Maryland and took a class there wow. as well. Mm on Judaism and his Jewish values. He'd been to um, Israel, I guess, twice. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. But he, um, Henry, was um, Mm self-motivated. I did not, I never, I never had to say, you need to get up, you need to go to school, you need to go to work, (laughs) you need to do this, you know, ever. And the work he took upon himself was, I think, in large part, um, based on the assumption that you can make the world a better place Mm -hmm. by reaching out to people, by sharing yourself Mm -hmm. with people, which is what he really did as a young teenager he was willing to share himself and his identity because he thought it would help create a better world. Mm-hmm. I don't think he ever expected, I know I never expected, um, the the amount of vitriol that would be thrown, you know, at a child. Mm-hmm. And um, it took its toll. Over the years, it really took its toll. What do you want to know about him? Um, well, I guess I, I, I've been, and I know people around the country and the world have been inspired by the way that, that you have talked about him. Mm-hmm. And I think that his message that you said, you know, that he knew that his message could get out there and you've really taken that up. And we say in Judaism when someone dies, and for those who who aren't familiar with Henry's story, Henry... Uh, unfortunately died um, two two years ago. It'll be two years in December. It'll be two years in December. Um, and when, when someone passes, we say, may, may his memory be for a blessing. And the way that you have carried on his legacy, I think, is, is part of what makes his memory a blessing in really beautiful ways. Can you talk a little bit about the ways that his both his work in his life and then also his passing have kind of shaped your work? Well, Henry taught me so much that I never knew. I mean, even as a physician, Mm. we hadn't been trained about gender. Mm -hmm. We hadn't been trained about so much of of what he taught me. So for me, he was like just a gift Mm. of, of a world that I was just, I had not known. And as a medical doctor and a parent, well, you better find out pretty quickly because you're talking about decisions with your own child. Mm -hmm. So um, I forget what the question was, but I mean, he was an amazing teacher. He really was. And he wasn't just, he didn't just teach me. I mean, this book that was dedicated to him is written by a journalist who apparently talked to him over the years hmm. about his life. He did things like that. He was willing to share his existence with people if he thought it would help people to understand. Um, and then, you know, he believed in politics. He believed that we could make the world a better place through politics. Mm -hmm. And then that was really the goal of politics. Mm. It was not 
to be self-serving. It's not to go up there and get elected so you can pass a bill that literally affects your own business interests, Mm -hmm. guys. That's happening in this city right now. That's not the, that's not what we're doing. That's not why we are here. And he knew that, and he lived by mm. that. There's no question. Thank you for sharing so beautifully. I wanted to ask, um, we're very fortunate at OZS in Lexington to have a growing number of trans folks joining our community. And our shul is is sort of learning how to become inclusive and Mm -hmm. celebrate trans joy and think Mm -hmm. about ritual differently. And I'm also sort of acutely aware of, you know, being a little affirming island in a state that is so unaffirming and so scary for trans kids and people who belong to the LGBTQ community. And I'm curious if, um, you know, you're, you speak so beautifully about Henry's legacy and what he taught you. Um, and when you think about Jewish community or communities really taking seriously the call to be affirming and safe, is there anything that we should know? What are things that we can be doing to ensure that our shuls, our communities, our public spaces, um, our homes, you know, all of these places amid such horrible, horrible legislation, what can we continue to do to keep trans people and queer people safe? You know, Henry never was always felt accepted Mm -hmm. at Temple. That was never a source of of significant discomfort at all. And I I can say that was the only school I cannot say that for. Mm -hmm. Swim team, you know, nothing else could I say that for. The things that are important, I have gender-neutral restrooms available. I mean, how simple is that? Mm-hmm. That somebody doesn't have to be scared which restroom can I use. Mm-hmm. Be inclusive in your language. Mm-hmm. You know, the truth is, historically, a lot of gender, a lot of transgender people don't want to be out. Mm. Right. They are only out now. The adults are coming out now literally to protect the children. Mm-hmm. I mean, these are people who have been transitioned their entire life, but the majority of people that surround them would not know that. But because the children started coming out and started getting attacked, a number of trans adults have felt like they are obligated Mm. to step up Mm -hmm. for them. Mm. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to in that situation. Wow. Um, Everybody's human. Everybody is the same human. It doesn't take any rocket science to figure out how to make somebody feel included rather than excluded. (laughs) And that's... Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I um I heard something this was after Henry passed. But this really struck me. Fitting in is the opposite of being included. Hmm. Because when you fit in, you are just striving to meet the requirements of whatever social group it is that you are trying to be accepted by. Mm -hmm. It is the opposite of actually being comfortable and welcome. Hmm. And I think Henry spent most of his life just trying to figure out how to fit in. Mm -hmm. I don't know that there there were very few spaces where he actually felt unequivocally welcomed. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a real, you know, charge for all of us to create the spaces and the uh, and the frameworks for people to feel included. Right. And for people to feel truly welcomed. And you guys, it's not that hard. 
Right. And, I mean, you know, yeah. you could say, because you were asking, you know, what Jewish um, thought, you know, Rabbi David would say, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, which I almost answered with. Um, but but in my head, for some reason, it goes there, but for the grace of God, go I. Mm-hmm. And ask not for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. Mm-hmm. And those those messages remind me that I am no more human and no less human than anybody else. We all have the exact same spark of the divine within us. And if you remember that, if you remember that God created us all in his image, each and every one of us, then you can't go too far astray. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. So as we touched on briefly before, we know that Henry is not your only child. And we know that you're no stranger to rabbis uh, (laughs) because uh, your daughter, Rachel, graduated from Hebrew Union College. Uh, And so the first question I wanted to ask you is because we haven't had either any of our parents on. What's it like to be a rabbi's mom? What's it like to be like the parent of a rabbi? (laughs) I'm extraordinarily proud. (laughs) Very, 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 very proud. And, And I mean, in all honesty, and I don't even know if Rachel knows this, but I um. I was really worried when I had Rachel that I didn't know how to raise a Jewish child. Mm-hmm. It was one of my big, big, big concerns. I was, I, mean, I was married, you know, when she was when she was born, but her father and I split almost immediately. So I was a single mom trying to figure out how do I raise a Jewish child in Louisville, Kentucky. And um, I think I succeeded. <laughs> I, did. I think I succeeded. Yeah. You, mu- you must have done something yeah. right. <laughs> it was camp. It yeah. was camp. Jewish summer camp. It always comes back to yeah. Jewish summer camp. Camp changes everything. It does. Yeah. Yeah, and I, especially I think for kids who grow up yeah. in places like Lexington and Louisville, it right. gives them a real anchor. Mm-hmm. Yes, a real sense of community. Right, and um, one in which they are not the minority. Right, right. right. It's the place where you go, and it's yeah. it's Jewish normative. It's that yes. it's the norm that everyone is Jewish, mm-hmm. that everyone yeah. does Shabbat, that everyone does all these things. That's just like, yeah, of course, that's what we do. And I think that right, especially for people from Jewish communities in which that's not the dominant culture, it's life-changing. Yes. And she was very, very involved with Nifty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That made a huge difference as well. Yeah. Nifty, uh, for folks, is uh, is the National Federation of Temple Youth, I believe, and is uh, one of the Jewish youth movements or youth groups uh, that's a, a nationwide movement but has chapters in a lot of different cities. And so being involved in that is kind of – it's almost like taking a taste of camp home with you and being involved in kind of Jewish youth activities in your city. Mm-hmm. Were you involved in a youth group then? I was very involved in Young Judea. Um, which was, which is not, so Nifty is the reform movement, USY uh, is the conservative movement, NCSY is the kind of more dominant modern orthodox movement, and then Young Judea is a pluralist movement that has people from all sorts of different um, backgrounds uh, and is, uh, yeah, it was a big part of my. If I remember correctly, I think Henry did a trip to Israel with Young Judea. Oh. Yeah. Go team. Yeah. (laughs) Did you do, were you involved in a youth group growing up? Dr. Berg? Oh, yeah. Very much so. But back then, it was really, um, I mean, we had Nifty at the temple, mm-hmm. and then we had um, B'nai B'rith mm-hmm. at the JCC, right. the yeah. Jewish Community Center. And we did both mm-hmm. in our family, but um, I think the majority of families in the city just did BBYO, mm-hmm. and it was much more social yes. than just... Like, I mean, Nifty is social, but it's a different, it's more Im- imbued with, with, 
with education with, and ritual and, and, and ritual yeah. and yeah. song and yeah that type of thing mm-hmm. and yeah. do you feel like growing up here most of your friends were jewish and also temple kids and nifty kids and bbyo kids or not so much for me growing up here almost all of my friends were jewish mm-hmm. And that was a combination of two things. That was a combination of BBYO at the Jewish Community Center where I spent all my weekends Mm -hmm. and the fact that I ended up, because of redistricting and all that stuff here in Louisville, even though I never moved, I, like, ended up at one point going to, like, eight different schools in eight different years. Oh, wow. wow. Right. (laughs) So... It wasn't like I had a cohort of long-term school friends, a lot of school acquaintances, Mm -hmm. but all my friends were were really through BBYO growing up. The community was tighter. The community was closer. Mm -hmm. And it didn't matter which congregation you belonged to. Everybody knew everybody. And we all went to the same parties and the same dances and the same everything. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. It's funny in, in Lexington and I'm well, I think it is worth saying that, you know, we have kids at our congregation who who don't know kids at the reform congregation, which seems so silly to me because we're a really small community. And you would think that Jewish kids would find each other. or I mean, we should be doing more to connect them is really the lesson. But it sounds like it's changed yeah. a fair amount. And some of that is also geographic shift that. So much of the Louisville Jewish community used to be centered first downtown and then around the highlands and then has kind of diffused. And so you do get people going to a lot of different schools. And because they no longer live close to the JCC and people don't make it a point that they're dropping their kids off there every day or the kids are biking over or walking over, they don't have that same central meeting place in the way that that it used to be. And so, yeah, so I think that that diffuses it. And you know, we can trace all of the various sociological reasons that people move to different parts of cities and all of that. But it's very similar to Chicago, Detroit, you know, lots of places that had kind of flight to suburbs and exurbs and all Mm -hmm. of these things um, that people didn't really think about what it was doing to Jewish communities to make those moves. Uh, That here in Louisville, when people moved from the Highlands to Prospect or to off Brownsboro or to wherever it was, they didn't think about what that meant for them Jewishly. That wasn't necessarily a part of their calculus when they did it. But what it meant was it wasn't going to be as easy for the next generation to have that kind of Jewish nucleus of friend group. Well, and even like I can remember when I was a kid, Hebrew school Mm -hmm. was at the JCC. Right. We went to the JCC two afternoons a week and, and did Hebrew school, if you chose to do Hebrew school. Not everybody did. But then my kids' Hebrew school was at our congregation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you just don't have the the opportunities to meet kids from other congregations as readily. Now, when they get older, like Rosh Chodesh, that was a great program for Mm. both of my kids at the JCC. But, yeah... Yeah, and, and just to your point of, like, trying to do more, we, that's one of the things that we're, we're – just to be candid, one of the things we're working <laughs> on here in Louisville is doing more joint programming because right now there's kind of two Hebrew schools. There's one at the temple and one for the other congregations in town, and we're trying to do things that get the kids together, that get them just to meet each other, to do things around holidays together because, right, you want to have that that crew, that that – Jew mm-hmm. crew, for lack mm-hmm. of a better word, um, <laughs> that that connects you to each other. Because I think it is really important in maintaining Jewish identity. And then, as Karen was saying, go to summer camp. You, yeah. you get you get it there. You get it <laughs> get in it that there. in that like yes. big dose that you can't get it, in medical terms, right? right? It's like the 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 loading dose that that gets it in there. And then you have the maintenance, you know, throughout I mean, the year. If you if you want a prescription <laughs> for raising your children Jewish. In the Midwest South, Mm -hmm. it's summer camp. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's summer camp, summer camp, summer camp. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we can work on offering a bluegrass schmooze uh, discount code for Jewish summer camp. Ooh. (laughs) I like it. I like it. So, Dr. Berg, you are also the daughter of Dr. Berg, as you mentioned, of Dr. Harold Berg, also a prominent physician who had a prominent side gig. He was an (laughs) artist. Uh, And his mosaics are on display in many synagogues and other institutions throughout Louisville. And the very first time I set foot in our synagogue, they pointed out one of your dad's mosaics. And they said, 
there's a bunch of teeth in there. <laughs> <laughs> it was his children's teeth um, that he worked into his mosaic. What was it like knowing that your dad was putting your teeth into his art that was like being put into synagogues all over town? <laughs> First of all, it wasn't just art teeth. It started with art teeth. Oh, It okay. started with my oldest sister. <laughs> She went downstairs when dad was making a mosaic. She said, look, dad, I lost a tooth. And he said, oh, let me put it in the mosaic. Okay? So, so it, was a, it was a happy accident. The it was a happy time. accident. But then, you know, it got out. People started donating teeth. I <laughs> still have small containers of unidentified teeth oh my God. in my basement. <laughs> um, anyhow, no, people just really liked it. It was really... Now, when I was a kid, you know, I still wanted the tooth fairy. And if I gave my tooth to be in the mosaic, then there was no tooth fairy. <laughs> so I was not all that thrilled about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then a lot of people think he was a dentist because of it, but he wasn't. I mean, he was a general and vascular surgeon. But yeah. Right. I always assume right. I they said he was Dr. Berg and the teeth were in the thing. So I always assume dentist. Yeah. It was your daughter who who corrected me on right. that. Right. A lot of people think he was a dentist, but he wasn't. Yeah. I remember when it was like my first walkthrough of the synagogue. It might have even been before we moved here. They were giving us like a video tour. They're like, Oh, here's this pretty mosaic. There's teeth in it. And my wife and I were just like, This is how they're introducing their building to us. It's like <laughs> Pointing out the Welcome. mosaic with the teeth. <laughs> with the teeth. And like, well, they must think that like we're the kind of people who can hang with that. So you know that that, <laughs> that, that felt good. But yeah, I just I always went because I I had been told it was all y'all's teeth. So I did. But so do you know which ones your teeth are in? No, okay. no, no, no. It was a equal opportunity. <laughs> uh, <laughs> can you see the teeth? In the oh pieces? yeah, oh, oh yeah. yeah. Okay. If you look, actually, I went up. Um, my sister and I went up to a dinner in Lexington. <laughs> Oh, a couple months back, and they had a mosaic in their auditorium, and I was able from a distance, actually, to show them where the teeth were. <laughs> I really was. Was that at a synagogue in Lexington? or In a synagogue in Lexington, yeah. Huh. Um, I forget which one I was at. Downtown. Um, Temple at Israel. I think it was. About, they were doing um, a program about Jewish, how we educate our educators in oh, Kentucky. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Holocaust Education Initiative. Right. That was part of the, I went down there because I'm on the anti-Semitism task mm -hmm. force and I just thought it would be nice, you know, to hear what they're talking about and do. And he had his mosaic down there that I didn't even realize. Wow. A nice little one. I liked it. I was just there last night. And I found the teeth <laughs> in it. Yeah. So for Schmooze listeners, we'll, we will include a picture of the mosaic that's <laughs> yes. in KI and you can blow it up on your computer screens. It'll be on our website uh, and you can you can do a little search for yourself to, to try to find the teeth. <laughs> uh, but you mentioned the the task force and we, we talked about it at the beginning, but I wanted to ask you, what has that been like? The it's I, I don't know how many states have an anti-Semitism task force. I can't imagine it's that many of them. Uh, I think it's really wonderful that that Governor Bashir appointed that. What has the work on that been like? Illuminating. I mean, I've learned a lot, and I, we are still learning. Um, a lot of what I've learned is that we have some really good programs in the state mm -hmm. and some really good work being done training our educators on how to teach mm -hmm. Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And, you know, guys, you all know, I don't have to tell you, those who don't remember history are doomed to, to repeat it. Yeah. And this is a lesson that is being lost. We are not doing an adequate job yeah. of teaching generations behind mm -hmm. us what they need to know to prevent this type of thing from happening to them or generations beyond them. So that's very, um, it's been very interesting, interesting for me. A lot of interesting information. So far, I haven't come up uh, they'll probably think of something that I'm forgetting. <laughs> but specific um, action points, I'm trying to remember. There was one that seemed pretty like, yeah, that we definitely needed to do, but I can't even remember what it was because we're not done and we'll come to it at the end. But right. It's still early on. It's, it's, all, it's been less than a on. year. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I am finding it <clears throat> very, very um, interesting. Hmm. Good. Little, you know, sometimes you like to put your head in the sand mm -hmm. and pretend that scary things aren't happening. 
And if you're an optimist, you're very good at sort of looking away from that mm-hmm. stuff, mm-hmm. not letting it register as much as other things you let register. So sometimes it's a little, um, ugh. Yeah. You yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're seeing some upsetting flyers being distributed around Lexington ahead of the election. And yeah. I think it's our responsibility to know and be aware and sort of pay close attention. So we're so grateful that the task force exists to help us do that. Yes. Um, and we also can't live in fear. Yeah. Right. Can't live in fear. I think it's really interesting. I hadn't thought about it, but I think that, you know, I think it's so important that this task force exists. And I appreciate that you're on it and that other, you know, Jewish leaders from across the state uh, are and non-Jewish leaders, I should mention, that there are non-Jews on there as well, which is so important that this is, you know, not just a Jewish issue. But it makes me think that, like, we should have like a Jewish joy task force also. Right. That like we shouldn't just be, you know, the (laughs) anti-anti-Semitism brigade brigade that like, you know, we should have alongside the anti-Semitism task force. We should have a like, hey, how cool is Judaism task force Mm -hmm. that just talks about like, how do we how do we do that? So. I think uh, I think all of that together is uh, is important. Mm-hmm. Well, well, and and let me jump in for a second. Yeah. One of the things that I really am committed to when I agreed to sit on the task force is that this is not just about anti-Semitism. Yeah. Right. It's about xenophobia in all its forms, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because that's right. the way that's the way to keep yourself safe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's the way to keep your neighbor safe, and that is the way to keep the world safe. Mm-hmm. Yep. You attend to everybody, not just what do I need. Mm-hmm. And I think we're really honestly committed to that perspective. I really do. It goes back to what you said at the beginning, right? right? If I'm yes. only if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? We have to have this task force. But if I'm only for, for myself, myself, what am I? Then? What am I? Right. There are other people who experience right. these types of yeah. attacks and that, you know, when we look out yeah. for ourselves and them, we make the whole stronger. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we have had some very interesting discussions about how to empower other communities. Mm -hmm. Um, Because we're pretty good at it. Yeah. You know, we really are. Mm. Um, Interesting, interesting. I mean, just very interesting discussion so far. Mm. Well, thank you for your work on that. Um, We like to round out our episodes with a quick lightning round. Some just really <laughs> fast questions about <laughs> different Jewish things um, that are not intended to provoke any anxiety or really, you're not <laughs> okay, supposed to I'm think. I'm already anxious, so you're not <laughs> doing a good job, but we'll try. Okay, we're just going to jump right in. Favorite Jewish holiday? Favorite Jewish holiday would be Pesach. Great. Nice. Yeah. Excellent answer. Honey cake or apples and honey? Definitely apples and honey. Yeah. No, not even a oh. discussion. <laughs> I knew I liked you. <laughs> <laughs> Best Purim costume that you've worn or that you've seen? Or that your kids have worn. Okay, well, this is a complicated answer, guys. Okay. Because we were trying to make it illegal in this state oh. for a man to dress like a woman or a woman to dress like a man. Mm-hmm. And I kept thinking back to when I was a kid and people would like dress up like Mordecai and mm-hmm. people would dress up like Esther and not necessarily of the same yeah. gender mm-hmm. identity, right. you know. Yeah. So I was like, what in the hell are they talking about that there's a problem with this? I mean, it was sort of I, I didn't understand their concerns about it, to be honest. Um, but, yeah, I guess dressing up as Esther, yeah. I think, is probably... I still have a beautiful gown at home ah. that I don't fit into anymore, but that I would have worn at one time, yeah. I, I will share quickly. I know we're in the lightning round, but I that year when that bill was in the uh, in the legislature, uh, the clergy in Louisville, a lot of us actually did dress. And so I, I was polyester. I was from <laughs> New Jersey. I was late to my Hadassah meeting. <laughs> Uh, it was a it was a got got the outfit from the the nearly new shop support yes, the NCJW yes, yes, the yes. National Council of Jewish Women. Um, okay, uh, best <laughs> breakfast food at the end of Yom Kippur. What are you going to first to break the fast? Google. Google. Good yeah. answer. Yeah. Favorite biblical character. Oh my God! Yeah, Favorite biblical character. Mm-hmm. Rachel. Hmm. She cried for her children. Yeah. 
She wept for her children. She heard them crying. Yeah. Yeah. And we just read that. Yeah. And last but certainly not least, Hamantaschen or Latka? Oh, my God. Well, no, that's, we not, ask the that's hard question. not fair. <laughs> because they come at different times. Right. Not, uh-huh. they, you do not, one is not exclusive of the other in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> So I don't know why you would even have to choose one or the other. If you gave me like a lifetime, <laughs> lifetime, yeah, I would probably choose latkes. Nice, yes. But no, Same. it is not. That question <laughs> should not be asked. Wow, I don't think anyone's ever pushed back on that question. That's the most pushback we've like that. ever gotten about that question. That's wild. <laughs> we'll rewrite it. We'll, we'll <laughs> yeah. tweak it a little. I feel pretty strongly about this one. Clearly. Guys. I do. Now, if you ask me applesauce or sour cream. Also a good question. Sour cream. Mmm, interesting. It's funny. I grew up with applesauce and then learned about sour cream on latkes in college, and it has changed my life. Yeah. Wow. Actually, I do a mixture of both oh. sour cream and then a little bit of applesauce mm. on top. The sweet I'm just saying the good. best answer to that is brisket. Just put some brisket on your <laughs> latkes. Eat it. It's amazing. Thank me later. <laughs> well, I was between the kugel, and then I was thinking, well, maybe, no, maybe I want Risk it. Mm. And I was thinking, no, I'm not going to be doing meats. I'm going to be doing, yeah. There, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. L'chaim right. of the month? Yeah, so we, we conclude uh, our each of our, we, we don't have a l'chaim here for you. I'm sorry. We do have to drive home after this. <laughs> but uh, but we do a l'chaim of the month, which is an opportunity to uh, raise up. It can be a person. It can be an organization. It can be uh, kind of whoever you want to just give a l'chaim to. Uh, to let all of our listeners know how great they are, um, how 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 much we appreciate uh, them, and so you kind of just think about you know whoever that can be. So uh, I'll go first because you might want to take a second to think about that. Um, but I want to give uh, my lechaim of the month uh, this month. Um, it is as we said November. It's uh, Trans uh, Awareness Month. That there's an organization called Keshet. Uh, that does really, really amazing work uh, with yes. uh, with queer Jewish community and especially with queer Jewish youth. Um, mm-hmm. They do really amazing work doing gatherings, mm-hmm. doing um, do, uh, creating uh, materials for learning and educating and all of those things. Uh, and they're just a really, really great organization. I don't have a specific person there, uh, but to the whole organization, to Keshet, uh, L'chaim, and thank you for all of the wonderful work that you do. L'chaim. I want to give my L'chaim of the month to Alex Bellock, who's a community member in Lexington, who um, just started organizing a monthly um, Jewish text study group, almost like a chevruta group for queer Jews in Lexington. Mm. Um, And it's gained lots of momentum, and um, they're doing a lot of really good learning and within their group, but also teaching our wider community how to be more inclusive and more accessible and more affirming. So L'chaim to Alex. L'chaim, Alex. Um, Kamala Harris. We have an election in less than a week that really has the possibility of changing the trajectory of the history of this country. And I give her L'chaim to being able to get through this amazing marathon mm-hmm. that she's been through for, for knowing what her morals are for believing for knowing how she believes mm-hmm. you know she called me after Henry mm-hmm. died Wow, personally and um, I think she picked her running mate in large part because he has a history since the early 90s of supporting the LGBTQ community. And and for people like my children, this election is almost live or die. If you have gone to the Trump 47 webpage and look what he says about trans children and what he's going to do it's terrifying so for me I give all my strength all my wishes all my love to Kamala Harris L'chaim. L'chaim. Mm-hmm. 
And thank you so much, Dr. Berg, for joining us. It's been wonderful schmoozing with you. Thank you guys very much for inviting me. Thank you. And thank you to all of you. And uh, we'll be back uh, next month. We hope that you will join us. Uh, We'll be talking about the Jewish community of Lexington. Yes. Uh, So uh, we'll be speaking with folks in Lexington and learning a little bit more about the history and, uh, and rich traditions and culture that are unique to that wonderful Jewish community. So we hope you'll join us then. Thank you so much. The Bluegrass Schmooze is created and produced by Rabbi Ben Freed and me, Rabbi Shani Abramowitz. Our executive producer is Laura Ellis. We get audio assistance from Alex Biscardi. Our social media coordinator is Eden Unger. Our show is made possible by support from the Jewish Heritage Fund. Our opening and closing song is Jew from Kentucky, written by Dan Byrne and performed by Dan Byrne and Bridget Kalin. Thanks to Knesseth Israel Congregation in Louisville and Ojave Zion Synagogue in Lexington for believing in two young rabbis and helping us make this podcast a reality. You can find us on Instagram at Bluegrass Schmooze. For more information, to keep in touch, and to learn how you can help us continue this work, visit bluegrassschmooze.org. We're Jews from Kentucky, that's what we are. We drink our mint juleps from a kosher dill jar. Wherever we wander, wherever we roam, Jews from Kentucky is always at home. Sunday, everybody. Support comes from Vision Zero. On foot or behind the wheel, safety is a shared responsibility. And Vision Zero Louisville believes zero roadway fatalities is the only acceptable amount. Their mission is to create safe roads by design, engineering solutions, and education. More information at visionzerolouisville.org.